Christmas is just one month away, and Ix are in the hot seat for the Christmas show. How do you feel about that, fellas? I, I don't think we're a particularly Christmassy sounding band, are we? Sci- oh. Sci-fi Christmas. Um, I don't know. Honestly, that's, that's not a question I particularly have an answer for. So you're not looking forward to Christmas? Um, I'm looking forward to it, but um, I'm, I'm not sure that us being on the Christmas show... I don't know. Um, so I'm realising it's going to be the Christmas show. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for dropping this in here right there. That's yeah. good, good start. Mm. Cheers. Uh, no, we have no uh, pretensions to being Christmas related at all. So there's no Christmas tunes. We were, we were planning on getting a, um, a maybe a short album out before Christmas, but that's not going to happen because we've just run out of time. Yeah. So... No, no, there's nothing X related happening at Christmas. So. Well, I've discovered that you've started out around the middle of 2013. Can you tell me the idea behind getting together and forming the band? There were, there were several reasons for doing what we did right back at the beginning. Um, we used to hang out at a bar called The Railway in Southend, and um, it's a fantastic bar, fantastic people, fantastic crowd, really creative kind of hub. And the only thing that kind of rankled with us a bit was that there was a kind of prejudice towards electronic music. It was never really taken seriously, and uh, staff and you know some of the patrons too never really thought that you know serious electronic music was a thing. It was just like if you weren't you know strumming out on a guitar, then you weren't a musician. So we thought there were quite a lot of terrible musicians that strummed out on guitars in that bar so we, th- we figured we'd kind of if we could put together a band and actually produce an album that was of good quality without us necessarily being solid musicians you know we were, we were really starting out right in the beginning and we wanted to do everything the right way and make it a good quality product um, and just stick it to the guitar man basically and and that's what we started out to do and a year later System 7 our first album came out and was well received generally and we were quite happy with the results so we decided to do another eight albums <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were, we were very lucky with System 7 because it got picked up by the, um, the Guardian they have an end of year hidden gems of the year and they, they do a hidden gems that the Guardian votes for Guardian <coughs> newspaper and then hidden gems voted for by the public and someone um, chipped in with us and they, they picked us out along with the other ones that were suggested mm. by the public and we were in there in the top a really good, It was a really good spread, wasn't it, actually? Mm. All, the, all of those albums definitely deserved to be on there, including ours, obviously. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, all the stuff on there was like, it was... it was There's some interesting stuff, wasn't it? Hidden Gems was absolutely mm. the right phrase. That was some really good stuff. Mm. The name of the group? Um, that's, that's funny. Um... <laughs> Before before uh, being X, I used to be a game designer, and I worked on in the company that did the the game version of the film Dune. And in the film Dune and the, in the book, there is uh, a planet called X. And I t- <laughs> I chose the name X purely, and I, I mean this because a I had a lot of experience with with Jim from doing the games, but. The main reason that I chose the name X was because I thought it would look good on a poster. <laughs> I thought a nice black poster with bright white white X, you couldn't ignore that poster. Um, <laughs> and that was, yeah, that was pretty much the main reason for the name of the band. Yeah, it, it, it has turned out to be a slight problem because A, there was a number of other Xs that we didn't know at the time. Oh. And also, um, in terms of marketing, you can't have two-letter names for web addresses uh, on Twitter and various other things. So yeah. having a very short name has been a bit of a problem. So we're on Twitter as Xband UK because we couldn't just be X. Um, so yeah, people it, refer to it as Xband UK, which is rather annoying. Yeah, or, or just Xband. No, yeah. no band, it's just X. It's just the IX, yeah. Yeah. But, um, but equally, it, it, I think the other thing as well is uh, in June, X is a machine planet, I think, is it? It's, 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 a, machine a, pl- planet. it's a planet where they make machines and, and potentially sentient machines as well, which is illegal in the June universe, which was kind of interesting. So it's kind of like using machines in ways that are not supposed to be used. And that was one of the other things that kind of fed back into what we were doing. Is when we first started out, we were using uh, some 
some DAW software, some, some recording software that was basically meant to be used for dance music. And we wanted to take it and use it for experimental electronic music rather than dance music. And so it was kind of like using machines for not, you know, not for the purpose that they were meant for. So that kind of tied in as well. So it was kind of like once we thought of it, it was set. It was like the weirix, and that's the end of it. And it will make a great poster as well. And it also enables to have a theme to hang the first album off of. That the uh, System Seven is all about a sort of a short story set in the June universe featuring. The X and the, the, the various track titles. If you get the CD under each of the track titles, there's a few lines of, of what that track's about in terms of the, the narrative of that story. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a little bit kind of arty, but um, but we just wanted we needed a theme or something to hang the album around. There was an intention to actually release a kind of novella with the album, but you know, time constraints, it just and, and financial restraints. You know, it's just like those things. Cost money and time, and it's just like never going to have enough of either of those to do this. So we kind of dropped the book and uh, and just went with the album. So not, it's not. I wouldn't say it's 100% set in the Dune universe, but it is very heavily inspired by the Dune universe. So. So it was it an, an easy album to produce. It, it pretty much was actually. It kind of just flowed out of learning how to make music. Um, that was a, like because we were starting out from scratch. You know, there was a little bit of musical background. I was in a sort of punk band back in the eighties, but it, there was nothing really. You know, we, were, we weren't musicians, and we sat down and we decided to actually kind of do this thing. And so it was kind of a learning process. So we, we wrote the songs as an, you know on the fly. Everything, everything on the album was was made up literally without a plan. It was sit down, tinker. Does it sound good? Throw it away. Does it sound good? Yes, keep it. Um, and yeah, no, it was it was fairly fluid and fairly dynamic. And it, it it took a year to to get it mastered. That was the hardest bit. I think finishing up. That, that was the surprise. It, it yeah. took as long to get the the final mix and the mastering as it did to write the album. Yeah. So yeah. six months writing yeah. the album, six, six months, months. Yeah. more than six months probably, yeah. just remastering and remastering and remixing and just trying to get it so it had a, a, a feel to the whole album that we were comfortable with. Yeah, I think it's a, a lot of people underestimate how much mastering can make a difference. And like I say, like Ian just said, it was like the first six months was writing and we were like, oh, brilliant, we've done, we've finished. Right, let's put it out. Oh, no, we need to do this. Oh, no, we need to do this. Oh, my God, that sounds terrible. And, so, and, and then you spend another six months mastering. I mean, if you don't know about mastering, yeah, it's probably going to take that long. The second album took much less time. The third album, there were some problems, but it was a very long album. So, yeah, I think mastering is a much underappreciated kind of art mm. um, and harder to learn in some ways than actually writing music. Yeah, I, I, I can fully understand why so many people do put the mastering out to a third party to, to do for them. Uh, you, do you, did, so. you did the mastering as well? We, we did yeah, everything. we did it all yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if we were rich, we would pay someone to do it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. We would give some money to, to an expert to do it. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's a pain. And, and yeah. even getting the album into publication and promoting, and how, how easy or difficult was that? I mean, <coughs> in the production, again, we did everything ourselves, mm. you know, because we, we didn't have any backing. Nobody was kind of behind us. Nobody knew we even existed for the first year. So it was it was everything we had to do ourselves. We designed the album artwork, we, we get the album artwork printed, we press the CDs, we do everything ourselves. Um, and the promotion, that was all, all you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, initially um, we, we were thinking rather naively that you, know, you produce a piece of work, you put it out there and we'd all be mysterious and stand back and let it speak for itself and it soon became apparent that you really do have to tell everyone about it. So mm. I started using Twitter and to a lesser extent Facebook to start promoting it, you know, the usual thing, sending out copies to all the different um, review websites and magazines and things. Um, and it, it's, it's very mixed. Um, contrary to expectations, by far the most success we've had is with Twitter. Um, I think maybe it's more interactive, you can, you can start chatting to people and people get a feel for what you like as, as people and you know, sense of humour and all the rest of it. Um, so that, that's been quite good for us. 
Um, in terms of getting reviews, it, it's mixed. Some, uh, I don't think we, we've not had a bad review, have we? All the reviews that we've got have been very um, positive. Yeah, no, um, yeah but I mean, the worst review we've ever had was like they just weren't interested in electronic music. Hmm. But they said it was kind of, it was kind of good for electric music. Yeah. So yeah, but um, it, 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 it can be quite dispiriting when you you know you send out a hundred codes to different websites and you find it a month later, you know, twenty of them have downloaded the album. Yeah, and the other eighty have just pretty much jumped in the bin and not even thought about it. Yeah, it wouldn't be so bad if they'd listened to it and decided they didn't like it. They've not even bothered to yeah, listen to it. Yeah, I'd rather so get it, slagged off than ignored. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it, it is. It is a lot of hard work, and because there are so many, because it's so democratised now that anyone can really do this. You, know, you don't need a record company. You don't need PR people. You, you mm. can do it all yourself. But the result of that is there's an awful lot of people yeah. doing a very similar thing. And it's trying to rise race. above that in the pond and, and get yourself noticed is very, very challenging. We keep trying different things, different approaches. Um, some, you know, some work better than others. But, um, but so, yeah, so far, so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, you was, uh, like you were just saying there, it's kind of like a rising above the time is, mm. is, is difficult. So did you get airplay with the first album? Um, we yeah. did, yes. Um, it, it's, it's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on the album isn't necessarily a thing most radio stations would play, uh, but the first track on it, um, Breaking Faith, that's that's quite rocky, almost sort of Nine Inch Nails like, isn't it, in, in, a, in a way? Uh, so, we had quite a bit of air play with that, um, mainly um, internet radio stations and podcasts and things. We did um, strike quite lucky because we, we, someone did suggest that it was worth trying all the American college networks, so we bombarded all those. And one of the biggest ones, Penn State, which I think has oh, it's uh, huge, it's, huge, yeah, it's a million listeners or something yeah, crazy ridiculous. over there. And they, they've played this quite a few times yeah. now uh, across all three albums. Um, so they, they've been very good for that. So that was a nice surprise. Um, but it, it, yeah, it's because we're not the usual vocals, straightforward, dancey type electronic music. Trying to find radio play can be challenging, but we've yeah. done okay actually. Yeah, it's, it's been quite good. I think being in this band, you've got to find niche radio stations and niche mm. listeners. And that's the thing, and it's just like in in the world where there are literally a million radio stations, finding the right radio station for you is is tricky. Mm. It's just an ongoing task, really. But you know, plug away and hopefully. <laughs> you discovered. <laughs> well, I've discovered you. Yeah. <laughs> so slightly less than a year later, you released your second album, Seven Three Zero Two. Uh, by contrast, this album is a little shorter. But what was the history behind the album? Um, we, when we first started out, I mean, when we first started out, we, we kind of were thinking the concept albums were the way forward. But after we did the first one. It was, it's very tiring to work on a concept album where everything ties together. You, you kind of, you get, it becomes almost, but not quite a chore to finish that album, especially when we had trouble with mastering. So once we'd done se uh, System 7, it was like, oh, I just don't want to do that again. Don't want to get into that minefield of kind of long, complex kind of mastering sessions and themes that run through and background story and stuff. So we want to do something that's just, a traditional kind of collection of songs, just bang bang them out. And we want to get some vocal stuff in there too, because we didn't really have much in the first album. So 7302 is it's like an almost it's a release, a a, a, a holiday away from the previous album. Um, it, and as a result, it's very mixed, isn't it? It's, it is, uh, yes, yeah, really eclectic. <laughs> Where, whereas you know the, the first one you really listen to almost as an end to end piece, and there's a, you know, a theme that runs through. 7302 is very much a, a, a random collection. You know, there's, there's some long pieces. I think there's, I think there's, there's a some style. Short, quirky ones. I think there's a style that kind of blends through that album. It's not, you know, the, the tracks themselves are not necessarily tied together in any kind of meaningful way, but the the kind of feel for the album is is there's some. It's my favourite one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's. Oh, I must be. We were pushing a little bit more over over um, uh, Halloween recently because there's a few tracks on there which are a little bit spooky and dark. Mm. Um, so it, it is a mixture. I mean, there's one which we, we refer to as the, the French track Last House, which is, is us trying to pay homage to bands like Air and things like that. Yeah. They have that, that lovely sort of feel to them. But equally, you've got a track. There's a cover version, No Place Like Home, where you, know, you listen to that and you want to put the lights on afterwards. Yeah. 
So it, it is it is quite a mix down as well, I think. And it was accidentally a bit short. And yeah, short it was actually. It, <laughs> <laughs> it was an action. That was a really funny story. Um, one of the pieces of software that we used when we were creating the album. Um, it's called CD Architect, and it's uh, it basically. It lays out all of the tracks and all the gaps in between the tracks and all the timings and stuff. But there was there's an error in that program where it actually di displays the running time of the album incorrectly under certain circumstances. And we thought we had a 50, 58 minute long album, but it's actually 38 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we released based on that number, thinking, oh, that's good, um, that'll, that'll do. So we ended up with a very short album. Um, so we slapped on an extra track uh, to make up for it, uh, which actually turned out to be a very well-received track. Yes, yeah, it, it's a CD only, so if you, if you get the download, you don't get this track, if you buy the CD, there's an extra track called EMP, which a lot of people think is the best track on the album, so it's yeah. quite unfortunate, it's a CD only special. Um, Maybe we'll so do a remix and uh, release it separately later. Yeah. Sounds like a marketing ploy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 7302, the remix album. Yeah. So you do like your numbers. Uh, you have released your third album this year, titled <laughs> Six E Q U J Five. Now, <laughs> now, curiosity led me to check this out and I discover that it's certainly a unique combination of letters and numbers. And it seems you might have an interest in space and the universe. Could mm -hmm. be. Yep. It's it's uh, actually named after the Wow signal. Uh, SETI back in the seventies were doing their thing, scanning the sky, and um, all of a sudden a really strong signal came out, uh, and uh, you can still see the printout of it, it's a stream of numbers, and in the middle of it there's this off-the-scale strength signal that says 6EQUJ5, that was effectively the, 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 the signal that was coming through. Signal someone, strength. Is signal, it is yeah. The, yeah, oh it's a signal strength. Yeah. And someone drew a ring around it, like, wow, and a big exclamation mark, so it's known as the wow signal. And that was really the beginning of the, of the album, uh, well actually, the album originally started as a, a soundtrack for a, a short film that never got made. Yeah. Yeah. But then having picked up the pieces, we then looked for a theme and, and 6 EQ UJ5 and the Wow signal came out. So the album ended up being themed around mysterious objects or messages from space or any, anything around that really. Yeah, I mean, one of the things with the, with the third album was we have, a, we have a tendency to write way more songs than we actually need for an album. All, all of the albums have actually got, I'd say probably about at least a dozen extra tracks that have never been released. Um, but the, the third album, we decided to actually incorporate most of the tracks that we wrote. So it became incredibly long. I mean, it's tw tw 20, Two hours. 22 <laughs> tracks long, is it? Something like that. Um, which is kind of insane. Too much to fit on a CD for sure. Um, and I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the side effects of it being so long was that we ended up, um, because we couldn't release it on CD, we ended up releasing it as a special edition on a USB stick, um, which somewhat insanely included extra tracks. So you've got the 22 track download, or you've got the USB version, which had that plus Plus four extra, it, tracks. Yeah, four extra tracks <laughs> and the making of and all sorts of a uh, what, what they tend I think they're called feelies aren't they it was something we pinched from Some Infocom feelies, that yeah. used to do adventure games back in the 80s uh, the old text adventures and they used to include lots of stuff in there that were kind of related to the game but just to have physical objects in your hand so we got these little various uh, star maps and yeah. all sorts of bits and pieces little in star there maps and little to go black with goo in oh yes the bags. black goo yes yeah. <laughs> Which, oh, your yeah, USBs have sold out. Yes, yeah, we yeah, that, that we did sell out. We're thinking of releasing a second batch, but they're incredibly expensive to manufacture so, and time-consuming. So, so they're very limited editions. <laughs> very limited, yes. Yes, they're quite expensive, but uh, mm. they're worth having if you've got one. Yeah, yeah they, they, they were very, very well received, uh, which, which was nice because obviously we, we were very nervous about the, the, the initial outlay, you know, because there was a, the, everything about it was quite expensive to physically produce, wasn't it? Just as a little interesting point about that, mm -hmm. if you if you haven't got one, the longest track that we've ever produced is one of the bonus tracks on the album that you can only get on the on the special edition, <laughs> and it's uh, I think it's 21 minutes long. Okay, so can you give me some insight into uh, where you get your track names from? 
That's an interesting question, actually. Um, unlike a lot of people, we don't necessarily know the track names until we've finished the track. In, in some cases, not until we release the album. Um, I think there was one track on the on the last album, and we didn't actually know what it was called until we were writing the the, the actual track listing onto the artwork for the album. We kind of made it up on the spot. So it's very tracks tracks tend to be what they are. They usually have a working name, and it's usually a really boring file name type name. And then we change it often during the progression of the development of the album. It confuses the heck out of me because quite often yeah. Darren will be working on a track. He'll send it to me. I'll be listening to it and then I'll be going back, oh, you know, let's, uh, can we just go through track, you know, three or two, you know, whatever the track's called is, like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's, he's got a different name by Yeah, it. I think my favourite one that I ever sent to you was, I sent you, a, I sent you a track to listen to and it was called Untitled 4 underscore version 7. <laughs> yeah, but um, I've, I've got a reasonably good hi-fi at home, so quite often uh, if Darren's got a track of things miles, he'll send me a bunch through and I'll be listening to them at home and making notes as to what needs tweaking then go back and that, that there was a lot of that on the last album that I was going back with suggestions and he was like don't know what that one is yeah. I'm working Names on the previous changed. name of the yeah. track from a, a few yeah, weeks we earlier really, we really should just sort that out but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and it often happens that by the, by the time Ian's reviewed a track um, and, he, and sent back his comments on it, the, the, the title of the track has changed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, I guess that, that sort of leads on to a, a point about the, the way we work as a band anyway. That Darren, by far, is the, the, the creative person. He he does all the music and, and stuff, and I tend to handle, handle the... Uh, the PR side more. And the mastering. <coughs> and the mastering, yeah. yeah. But what, what tends to happen is D Darren will work on a track and then he'll send it to me and I'll go through and somewhere between rip it to pieces to praise it, depending on what I think. But you know, I'll, I'll come up with comments as to what needs adjusting, you know, whether it's mastering problems or whatever. Yeah. And it kind of goes through a process of back and forth, doesn't it, really? Yeah, I mean, it's... So it's, I'm kind it's, of like a quality control person, almost. It's an interesting relationship because... Um, no, we've known each other so long. It's just like it, it, we never, never get precious about anything. You know, if I send something over and I think it's the best thing ever, and Ian says that is so terrible, what are you, what are you even thinking? Um, Fifty percent of the time, I'll go, fair enough, I'll change it. What's, what's wrong with it? Um, and the other, the other fifty percent of the time, I'll go, no, you're wrong. <laughs> it is genius, and it is going out. Um, but uh, yeah, no, we, we we never get we never fall out over over musical differences no, ever no. ever. That's not going to happen. No. Um, I suppose the only other thing is, is that I tend not so much lately, to be fair, but certainly in the early days, first couple of albums, because I listen to a lot more music mm. than, than Darren does. I would tend to hear interesting things. I'll be coming to you every week, wouldn't I? With oh, have you heard this? And then you'd have a oh, that's quite interesting. I think I can Absolutely. we can maybe do something with You've that. You've got much better ears than I have as well. Mm. You'll often hear kind of inconsistencies in the music or kind of frequencies that sound wrong or clash and stuff that I, I my ears actually just genuinely don't hear. Yeah. Um, so I, I've got very bass centric ears, and yeah. you've got very top end ears. <laughs> there, there's, there's one bit on System Seven that absolutely sorry, not on System Seven on um, uh, 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 yeah on yeah. Um, Saturn Five um, that really jars to oh, yeah. my ear. There's an extra echo or, or extra beat, and yeah. it really annoys me. And you've done everything you can to try and minimise yeah. it, but it, it, it's just a, it's just an artifact of the, the particular sound and the, and, the, and the echo and thing. Mm. Or the delay on it, rather, but it really jars to me. Uh, whereas you completely missed it, didn't you? There's been a couple. Of, there's a couple of tracks where you've heard something uh, and said, "There's a, there's a really high frequency noise there mm. that I can't hear at all. It's not in my ears to hear it." And so we have to kind of look at the frequencies and on the computer and actually do it visually, which is kind of interesting as well. And, um, I, I've Buggered my hearing so bad, <laughs> I can't actually. It's kind hear. of bad news if you do the music, but yeah, it's, uh, but, but it, I, th I think it's probably why an awful lot of the, the finished product sounds to my ears quite vinyl like. It's very warm mm. sounding. It's not really strident like a lot of you know sort of EDM certainly, but it, it's a much warmer kind of sound. I think that's because you, you get, your, your top end isn't great. Yeah, my top end isn't great, but yours is, yeah. and, and my bottom end is is kind of kind of solid. Mm. So we end up with that kind of nice gradient across the whole frequency range. Mm. Who knows? Yeah. 
but, uh, but it, it is surprising. Ha- I mean, again, going back to what we were saying earlier on about how difficult mastering can be, especially mm. if it's not necessarily your your thing that you know that you're trained to do. Is that we, you, know, you can do a track and it sounds great, and then you'll play it on the hi-fi, and the yeah. bass is completely overwhelming. You'll put it in the car, and it's just a wall of noise of muffled. I've, yeah, the van test. Different well, systems. So I've got, I drive a van. You know, I love a van, right? And uh, my stereo in the van is not good. It's, it's a van, right? So yeah, if I run a track through the van test and it passes, then it's good to go. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good on that stereo. It's probably okay. Yeah, because the last album, initially the bass was very overwhelming on quite a few tracks. Um, And I think you tried it on the van and you said it's it's just... Yeah, it's just blowing my speakers up. Yeah. Well, it's road testing, isn't it? Yeah, literally. (laughs) Literally, on the road. Because that's really weird, because I mean, it's exactly what I do. Mm. I actually take mine to the car. Right. And and, because road noise, I I think most people listen to music, or a lot of people listen to music when they're in the car. Mm. That's a huge percentage, yeah. Yeah, so so road testing mm. is real. Yeah, it's certainly. That, I mean, I like it's, it. it's surprising how many people well, do that. Better than van testing. Yeah, road <laughs> testing. But yeah, I mean, you know, chatting to people on Twitter, and it's amazing how many other bands and artists they, they say the same thing that their their final check that the mix is right is it sounds like in the car. Well, the thing is, is if if you're into your music, right, your home stereo is probably quite good. Your Walkman or equivalent, whatever you listen to music on on the go, is probably quite good because you like music, but. The system in your car is the system that came with your car. You, you probably didn't get to choose that unless you swapped it out for something better. And so it's kind of like base level, and it's always a good test to throw it at that. I'm very tempted to start testing things in my dad's kitchen because the CD player he's got in his kitchen is a POS. <laughs> suboptimal. Sub- suboptimal, yeah. Less than brilliant. It's just another abbreviation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the electronic music genre, I would say, has grown and spread over the years, but the number of sub genres. Uh, traditionally, it was a type of future music, but that's been mentioned to me that we've now arrived in, ta- in that time. Mm. But your music does reflect the sci fi element of the scene. Is this intentional or just where you prefer to be? Both. Um, we, we, we're both big sci fi fans, uh, always have been, uh, way before we started the band. Um, it was kind of it's, it's good as a source of inspiration I think you, know, you, you get ideas from sci-fi you get a, a feel or a vibe or something whether it's a, you know, a classic TV series or a film or something that quite often provides inspiration to start work on something I think nearly, every, nearly everything that we've ever done has had some story behind it and those stories you know, especially with the first album, which is obviously inspired by Jim, um, have a sci-fi background. The band itself, its name comes from a sci-fi novel. So it was always going to be a part of what we did, whether it was, you know, right up front, like 60Q, J5, which is all sci-fi stuff, or more hidden in the background, like 7302, which... You know, wouldn't necessarily be considered to be sci-fi inspired, but there are elements on that album that are quite clearly sci-fi inspired. So, you know, Glass House, for example, which is about moon bases. Um, so, yeah, it's it, it's both. It was like an intention from the start that we were going to be named after a sci-fi element, and we're both big sci-fi fans. So, pretty much everything we do is in some way kind of influenced by sci-fi as well. Yeah. So the first time I heard Saturn V, I was taken by it. A remarkable and envious track. Uh, how difficult or easy was this track to compose? It's really funny, actually. That track, I found, I found. I mean, you had quite a lot of input in on the mastering side of this one, didn't you? Because mm. it was it was quite complex mastering uh, this one. But from the writing point of view, for me, it was really easy. I watched a documentary about Saturn V rockets and there was this really long, drawn out, slow motion scene of a, of a Saturn V rocket getting ready for launch, pre-launch, and it was, everything was in slow motion and like ice was falling down and smoke was coming out 
and then the engines kicked into life and it roared up past the gantry and it was just like you know what that really needs a soundtrack <laughs> um, and that's 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 pretty much what we aimed to do and um, it, yeah it kind of it wrote itself I had always had that vision of the, sh of the, the ship standing there waiting to, to launch and mm. uh, it's got a very long intro that song and that's it's a song of two halves isn't it so it, if you yeah. can imagine you've got the Saturn V on, on the bass and as Darren said it's in slow motion and the first half of the track is very very slow um, and kind of laid back and mm. that is it ready to spring into life and then you get halfway into the track and all of a sudden, bang, it kicks off. That's, and that's the thing, that's it's like there's, that's, there's so much preparation and kind of anticipation of the, the launch of a sound fight. It's like, it's very drawn out, drawn out and dreamy and it's like anticipation builds and builds and builds and then when it goes, oh boy, does it go. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's what we tried to do with the track. It was like, it's like, it's coming, you know it's coming, here it comes, it's coming. And then it goes, and, and and from that point out, it's like non-stop to the end. It races to the end. Um, but it, 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 that track came out perfectly for the way I'd actually pictured it in my mind before I even played the note. Yeah. It was easy. It just fell out of my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I see that the three albums released so far are categorised in either a red or blue series. Uh, can you explain what the series are? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically, um, yeah, Blue Series uh, are collections of concept albums where an album has a, a running theme. There's something that ties all the tracks together, an underlying background story to everything that kind of inter uh, is interlocked with it, all the other tracks on the album. Whereas the Red albums are more eclectic. They are. Uh, more random, kind of sometimes more fun, sometimes more dark, uh, but not necessarily linked in any way. Um, and yeah, they tend they, they'll tend to be shorter the red albums because they are kind of one-off tracks rather than long pieces. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I think we discussed before the X name and possibly the difficulty of discovering you online. Have you done anything in order to make you easier to find? Um, I, th I think it's just sledgehammering um, social media, really. We just yeah. keep banging away, tweeting a lot, trying to put a lot on Facebook. It, it was interesting that someone who, who played one of our tracks on a radio show recently um, said, oh, next track up is X. He goes, I've got to say, I've never heard them before, but they're all over social media like a rash. Mm. So clearly... You know, just bombarding it as, from as many different angles as possible is paying some dividends. Um, but yes, it, it's uh, in, in hindsight we should we would have chosen a different name. Um, you know, it, it has been problematic on, on yeah. many levels. Um, I mean, it is an awesome name. Don't get me wrong, <coughs> yeah, I love no, it, and it looks yeah. great on a poster and a t-shirt. But it makes it very difficult to find the band on, online. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you, you can see why so many newer bands have got very strange names because mm. it does make you much easier to find on Google. I've just got to mention my favourite band name that I've heard recently and it was Auntie Mabel's Waffle Velocity. <laughs> it was just the most amazing band name. <laughs> A combination of words you're very unlikely to find anywhere. Yeah, absolutely, I'll forget. Mm. Oh, and um, Cowboy Flying Saucer, also. Are, are, they, are these plugs you're doing? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> you should check them out, they're both great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is very difficult though. Um, if, you know, it, there's so much stuff out there on the internet that it, unless you have a, a, a completely obscure name, um, you know, pe people googling your name or whatever, uh, yeah. it's very unlikely to to turn you up unless you're lucky. I mean, we, we are quite. It, it, it's it's slightly weird that when we when we first started the new album, um, you, know, you, you could Google X six EQ U J nine. Nothing, but G5 now five even. Sixty Q U five, yeah. Too many numbers. Um, but now, if you if you type into Google, the first two pages is pretty much all our stuff. Which, given how much stuff there is out there on sixty Q U, yeah, I think that's, that's quite a good position to be we've, in. We've done reasonably well with Google um, in the combination of numbers and our name. Mm. That's the thing. It's just like if you do type in sixty Q U J five I X. 
that 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 trims it down perfectly and we get the whole top page which is great but um, yeah apart from that it, it, it's it, there's so many Roman numerals on the end of things and you know Super Bowl 9 oh okay yeah that's us um, it makes it difficult to to fight your way through yeah I suppose we, that kind of leads on to a weird thing we've been trying to work out is that um, one of our tracks seems to be doing amazingly well on Shazam oh which yeah. is really odd um, it's a uh, Feynman point this is and this most is other tracks we've, we've got have been Shazam maybe a dozen twenty times 56 times is the second most popular Feynman point Feynman point 7,500 7, uh, so it must be being played somewhere but we don't know lot. where we can only think it's some art installation somewhere and someone's chuck that in there because Feynman point you know maybe has a maths angle or whatever this Sunday gone past it was shazammed once every 11 minutes for 24 hours area 51 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe it's just maybe. really it's just really strange we, we, we've been googling it to death trying to find out where this track could be turning up every 11 minutes yeah. every 11 minutes yeah and it's, it's constant every 21 minutes for the last three weeks Eric, if you want. <laughs> yeah. It's just Maybe, bizarre. Yeah, it's bizarre. I mean, it's just by leaps and bounds. And it's, it's, it's increasing the number of Shazams. Is, I can't remember what the average is, but it's like it's 68, 68 to 100 a day. And we have no idea where or why. <laughs> um, it's not even a it's not even a track that we've sent out to radio stations or anything. So it's not like it's getting played on a radio station unless somebody's like bought the album, fell in love with the track, playing twenty four seven. Yeah, somewhere. I don't know. But, but that also would suggest they, they they don't know what it is. So yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's weird. Shazam it. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> but I mean, the the, the 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 theories that we've been people have put forward is that someone at a like a big installation is put it on as a background music but if that's true the number of people that must be going through that installation A that like it B that pull out their phone C that have Shazam <laughs> and then actually bother to actually tag it it's staggeringly small diminishing numbers so the number of people that are passing through must be huge true so we'd love to know where it is. Um, uh, also, off the back of that, it's the only track off the album that people have bought individually. Yeah. So people either buy the album or they buy Fame Point. Yeah, it's, it's, our, it's our biggest hit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's def definitely going on the best of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And thus far, are you happy with the direction things are going? Yeah. I think so, yeah. I think, I mean, could we have more sales? Yes. Um, could we have been exposed? Yes. Are we happy with how things have turned out and the reviews that we've had? Yeah, I think we are. And we've, we've never had a bad review, which is great. Hmm. Yeah, it's... <sighs> it's slow, but it was always intended hmm. to be slow. Yeah. I think what's good is that we, we've always taken the view that we, we'll never put pressure on ourselves. So yeah. we did that with the second album, didn't we? So, okay, the album's going to be released on this date. Yeah. We got ourselves into a bit of a sort of a mess because there was some other stuff going on in, in sort of life anyway that got in the way. It wasn't terrible. But, but, but no, but, it, but uh, uh, the, the, the thing was, we said from now on, yeah, we'll, we'll release an album when it's ready. Yeah, it'd be nice to do an album a year or, or whatever, but yeah, no pressure. It's always been the watch no pressure. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it's not really best approach. Because really. yeah. if you do, you know, if you do draw a line in the sand, so we've got to have an album out on this day and start telling people about it. If it's not ready or you hit problems, it does start getting really, really difficult. I mean, obviously, we do set ourselves targets. You know, I mean, when we're really, really close, we go, okay, well. You know, it's it's the middle of the month now. Let's get it out early next month. You know, let's give ourselves a couple of weeks to finish up these last few things and get it out. I mean, we tend to release. It's not it's not a tend. We always release things on the ninth day of the month because it's right. So 
if if we're too far into a month, it's like it's not going to happen next month. It's going to be the one after that. So um, we we give ourselves that buffer of kind of you know, get it right rather than you know force yourself to finish something early. Um, I mean that said, nearly everything. I think this is a common theme with musicians is that they'll they'll abandon something rather than finish it. It will be as an acceptable abandonment is, is the kind of way that I think about stuff. Um, so you know, nothing's ever ever really truly finished. It's it's kind of put to bed and said, okay, that's good enough, and we'll uh, we'll put it out. It's good enough to release now. Um, and then it's obviously the the ninth day of the following month that it comes out. <laughs> Yeah, as he said, I mean, we were hoping to get now out, out for Christmas, but you know, time, well, by the end of this year. But I uh, think we might release. Really I think we still can release a single or an EP or something. Mm. We, 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 I'd want to. I'd like to. We've got a bunch of new stuff that's been sitting around, waiting to go for. Because the last album, this, uh, backtracking a little bit, the last album spiralled out of control. It was supposed to be a standard length album, you know, 10, 12, maybe 14 tracks. It ended up being 22 tracks. So it took a lot longer than we had anticipated. Um, and therefore there were other tracks that were written in the meantime, some of them earlier, some of them during the middle of that, that album. They were kind of put on the back burner. I'd like to get some of those out fairly soon. I think the thing is, it, We've, we've got an idea of the next two or three albums, and what tends to happen is you, you work on a track, won't you? So mm. that will work best on this yeah. album, that will work best on this album, yeah. and we just kind of you know, slot them into their respective Shows, yeah. places, and then it gets to the point where actually that album's now got enough tracks to finish. We'll, we'll push it out because yeah. the album that will probably be the fourth album was supposed to be the third album, yeah. but it, everything moved down one because we got a lot more tracks completed. For and of course, it probably won't have the title that is currently sitting under you know, <laughs> the title will change at the last minute yes yeah that was a that was possibly I mean we step. could release we could release an album we could release at least two albums now with the tracks that we've got sitting around but they're not quite up to snuff so they'll they'll need some work so one of them I'd like to get it out soon before Christmas maybe it's only a month away. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, no. That, that's that's just a testament to how many tracks we've got sitting around. We we do have enough. I mean, for example, the seven three zero two album. We could release an album that long right now mm. with just the tracks that are sitting around. If we want to release an album that's a bit longer than that, then it will take a little bit longer. I, mean, I don't know what it is now, but I, I know certainly. A little while ago, last time we looked, there was kind of a hundred tracks in various issues, various Tons. states of completion. Mm. Everything's in spreadsheets. It, <laughs> it says the amount of completion of a track in percent, and I'd say 80% of them are less than 10% complete. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, you know, there's still quite a few that are reasonably finished, they just oh, yeah. don't fit any album that. Listen, there was an, there's an entire album concept that, that was started on that has doesn't have a release schedule at all. That's from what up. Mm. That was that's a blue one for sure. <laughs> Maybe out sometime in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Are there more imminent projects in the pipeline? No, I don't know. In actual fact, saying that, I don't. Do I need to say that if you've been saying what you just said? No, that is a good question because there is another project that I've been thinking about doing. Actually, there's two, isn't there? There's Continuum, and there's the thing with Klaus as well, which we've never done anything about. No. Um, yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, Klaus, who I've mentioned to you before, uh, um, a band in Australia. They they said they wanted to do some. some something with us, some kind of collaboration but beyond the general idea wouldn't it be good to collaborate that's as far as it got really mm. um, it's not quite sure how that would pan out whether we'd be firing steps backwards and forwards or, or how that would work because the, they tend to pretty much improvise they'll, they'll play a piece live and just make it up as they're going along really and effectively record a live performance whereas we're far more kind of keep banging away in a studio refining and refining yeah so I'm not sure how compatible those working methods are but on the other hand that could be 
an interesting experiment. It might actually turn into continuum. That's the other thing mm. that we've been talking about is a non-ending piece of music that is continually added to forever and actually involves collaboration with anyone who wants to collaborate. Whereas we, we create a streaming server that streams a piece of music that you can then interrupt, edit and put back into the stream. Um, it's an interesting idea. How it would work in practicality, I don't know. But uh, we, we thought it as we do very, very quickly. We thought well, a crowdsourced, a crowdsourced piece of music. I think we all share a common thread with knowing Chris Watson is in the Moog Show. He is certainly a wonderful guy and a great supporter of new artists. Uh, would you say has helped you with recognition? I would say so, yes. I mean, I was introduced to his show by someone else um, when we very first started on Twitter. Um, and because he does feature a lot of um, bands, I've you know, you've sent him a few tracks through and he has very kindly played those. I think a lot of the, certainly on the Twitter side, a lot of people started following us and getting into the music because they've heard us on Chris's show. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think probably the majority of the Earth, one of the better phrase kind of super fans, the ones that have bought nearly everything that we've done. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're all people that they're we've, we've got yeah, to yeah. know through through that. Um, so yeah, no, it, 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 it's good. It, there's, um, I like the fact that he does mix, you know, do a show of you know traditional 80s music, or whatever, and then does a show of, of new bands. And we, we don't necessarily follow the pattern of a lot of the stuff that he does play because most of it is vocal uh, stuff, uh, which obviously isn't us. Um, so it's good that he does, you know, play as much of our stuff as he does. So yeah, yeah no, it's, no, it's, no, it's, it's, really it's very good, Chris, isn't it? Yeah, yeah and it, it's also a very good show. I like the fact it's interactive. You know, yeah. whenever a show goes out, there's just so much chatter on Twitter and people talking about the tracks and things, and it's a good way to get feedback as well. You know, I mean, certainly with the new album, I was very, very nervous about you know getting my first play on there because we'd, we'd started tweeting a new album was coming out and people started to you know. We could feel a bit of a build up of people coming back. Oh, when's the new album coming out? When's the new album coming out? Can't wait to hear a track. And then when the first one went out on Chris's show, we we're both kind of sitting there going, Oh, I hope people like it. Mm. But luckily, the, you know, the feedback immediately was really, really strong. So that was kind of a, a real phew moment. So, yeah. so yeah, no, it's, it's uh, I, I think, yeah, there's, there's, can't say anything uh, too, too. Yeah. I mean that said, I mean he is a bastard, and, he, <laughs> and, his, and his show isn't as good as yours. <laughs> Sorry, Chris, didn't mean it. <laughs> More Reddit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, but no, no, it's, can't can't say enough. Can't say enough nice things about Chris and his show, and their collection of snacks every week. That's what? The important bit. Oh, you missed that. Yeah. Um, yeah, every week there's a photo on Twitter of their snacks they've got for munch. Damn them. <laughs> Damn them and their, their snackage. Bar barbecue hula hoops, please. <laughs> Thank you. So this interview will be going out on my Christmas show. Is there any festive comments you'd like to tell the listeners? Ask for an X album for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. X t-shirts, they're X great. T -shirts. Yeah. Uh, a whole variety of really good t-shirts. <laughs> Badges, you could use them as like baubles if you wanted to. Yeah. Uh, what else? Oh, we've got slip mats, have we? Not yet. Well, yeah, Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Merry Xmas. Is that what you're after? Is that what Merry you wanted to say? Sorry, Merry Xmas. Yeah. Is that what it is? I haven't got any sleigh bells with me. We could have done a little thing. <laughs> I'll send you a jingle thing. We'll do that. Yeah, yeah. do that. Yeah, that. all right. Yeah. I'll do your Christmas thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've enjoyed catching up with you guys today, and I think we have a little more knowledge mix. I thank you very much for your time. Are there any last things you'd like to add before I close the interview? I don't know. Whose round is it? <laughs> it's been it's been, ha it's been fun having an interview in the pub. It's been a good day. I've enjoyed myself. It's been fun. Yeah, I'm just glad I'm not having to edit yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I've got anything to add really. No, it's been some good questions. Yeah, no, it's good. It's been fun. Hmm. Well, great to meet you. I'm looking forward to hearing more from you in the future. Let's hope to catch up again and carry on making music. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.